Tigers are the most deadly animal out of all the big cats and are even capable of winning a fight against a lion. Their immense size, expert stalking abilities, opportunistic nature, and territorial behavior make tigers one of the most dangerous animals to humans in the world. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the most terrifying tiger attacks on people we've covered on the channel so far. Welcome to Final Affliction. The Siberian tiger, sometimes referred to as the Amur tiger, is one of the most majestic animals on Earth and is the largest of all big cats. It is a species of tiger native to the forests of Russia, China, and North Korea. It is distinguished by its enormous size and powerful strength. To put it into perspective, some males weigh up to 660 pounds, equivalent to the weight of a large motorcycle. In addition to their massive size and strength, Siberian tigers have an incredible bite force comparable to that of a hydraulic press or a large crocodile. It is estimated that their bite force is around 1,000 pounds per square inch, strong enough to crush bones and kill large prey, like elk, with a single bite. A human's bite force is only around 160 pounds per square inch. Consequently, the Siberian tiger has one of the strongest bites of any land mammal, helping them become one of the most feared predators in the wild. If that's not enough, Siberian tigers are also powerful swimmers and are not averse to entering the water to hunt or escape danger. While these creatures are highly reclusive, they are at the absolute top of the food chain. Needless to say, they are incredibly dangerous to humans, especially if threatened or provoked. However, because these creatures are now considered endangered, conservation and protection efforts have been made throughout the years, including keeping tigers in zoos. Unfortunately, Siberian tigers have large home ranges, and being kept in a zoo may decrease the tiger's well-being, making them more agitated. Some people prod, tease, or otherwise provoke the animals in the zoo, hoping to invoke an exciting reaction from the animal, which creates a dangerous situation. This was the case with Carlos Sousa Jr. and his friends on that fateful Christmas day in 2007. It was June 25, 2003. The Denver Zoo was home to a small population of Siberian tigers. These magnificent creatures were part of a carefully managed breeding program that aimed to conserve and increase the genetic diversity of the species. In a large enclosure, a female Siberian tiger was born. The zookeepers and caretakers named it Tatiana. Born in captivity, Tatiana was not really an aggressive tiger and had no problems with people. On December 16, 2005, she was taken and permanently moved to the San Francisco Zoo to mate with a 14-year-old Siberian tiger named Tony. Everything was well until December 22, 2006, when Tatiana attacked her veteran zookeeper, Lori Komajan. In trying to feed her, Lori violated safety protocols and entered the tiger's enclosure alone without proper notification to other staff members. As Lori approached, Tatiana attacked her by biting and clawing at her, seriously injuring Lori's head, neck, and upper body. Hearing Lori's screams, the other staff members rushed to the scene to help. Thankfully, they were able to safely remove Lori from the enclosure and call for medical assistance. Unfortunately, this wasn't the last time Tatiana would make headlines. It was December 25, 2007. Carlos Sousa Jr. and his friends, brothers Amrit Paul and Colbert Dhaliwal, arrived at the San Francisco Zoo, excited to see the animals up close. Carlos was 17 years old at the time, while Amrit Paul and Colbert were 19 and 23, respectively. The three men marveled at the lions, the grizzly bears, and the primates but it was the Siberian tiger exhibit that drew their attention the most. As they approached, they saw the magnificent Tatiana pacing back and forth, the creature's amber eyes fixed on them. 
Carlos and his friends were in awe of the tiger's size and beauty. They watched as she crouched down, muscles ripping under her thick fur, and then pounced on a toy that had been left in her enclosure. Carlos laughed as he watched the tiger play, but then he noticed something that made his blood run cold. He saw that the wall separating the tiger from the visitors seemed shorter and that it appeared to be lower at one end of the enclosure than the other. Carlos pointed this out to his friends, but they laughed it off, saying that there was no way the tiger could jump over the wall. After all, there were barriers and trenches in front of the wall designed to prevent such a thing from happening. Amrit Paul and Colbert decided to do something stupid. The two brothers decided to taunt Tatiana. Colbert picked up a pine cone and tossed it toward the tiger in the enclosure. Tatiana stopped pacing and turned her head toward the brothers. Seeing what happened, Amrit Paul grabbed a stick and threw it in the enclosure. Suddenly, the two began shouting at the tiger, hoping they would get a reaction. Seeing their reckless behavior, Carlos did not want to participate and tried to stop his friends. They listened, but laughed it off. However, it was too late. Tatiana was circling in the enclosure. She jumped from the bottom of the dry moat to the top of the wall, gaining enough height over the top to pull herself over the wall. She eyed Amrit Paul and immediately jumped on him. The tiger's ferocious claws and teeth ripped apart Amrit Paul's skin. As Culber screamed in terror, Carlos tried to save his friend by shouting and throwing things at the angry creature. He then tried pulling Amrit Paul, but this only provoked Tatiana even more. Tatiana focused on Carlos and decided to pounce on him, quickly knocking the 17-year-old to the ground. The tiger then decided to pull him away from the group, mauling him and biting him in the head and torso. Meanwhile, Amrit Paul and Kulba ran for their lives toward the zoo cafe 300 yards away. However, since it was already closing time, the cafe was locked. Although the two brothers screamed for their lives, the cafe employees did not think much of it, suspecting that the screaming person was mentally ill and there was no actual animal attack. Eventually, Tatiana arrived at the vicinity and began attacking Clover. Finally, the cafe employee called 911, prompting emergency services and armed authorities to respond. I don't know if they're on the but they're screaming about an animal that had um, attacked them, but there's no animal out. He's talking about a third person, and I don't see the third person. Is he saying that he was bitten? It's the third as a dog now, and he's going on with dog, he's not drunk. Is he saying, is, he, is the patient saying that he was bitten by an animal? He's saying that he's bitten by an animal, but uh, there's no animal case because he could just be crazy. Okay. okay. Four police officers were dispatched to the area, and the entire zoo was locked down to prevent Tatiana from escaping. What the officers saw, however, was a gruesome sight. It was Tatiana biting down on Culber while Amritpal was on the ground, bleeding and screaming for help. The officers pointed their guns at the creature, but they hesitated for fear of hitting Culber. One of the officers created a distraction, forcing Tatiana to focus on them. As Tatiana angrily turned her attention to the noise, the officers shot her in the forehead, effectively killing the magnificent beast. When the paramedics scoured the scene, they found Carlos dead near the tiger enclosure. He had blunt trauma to his head and neck, scratches and bite marks to his head, neck, and chest, and skull and spinal fractures. His jugular vein was also severed in half. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, the zoo was closed while authorities investigated the incident and assessed the safety of the animal enclosures. It was learned that the walls for the enclosure were only 12.5 feet high, as opposed to the standard of 16 feet. The surviving victims, Culber and Emritpal, received medical treatment for their injuries. The attack also sparked widespread public concern about the safety of zoos and the treatment of captive animals. Some criticized the zoo for failing to properly secure the tiger enclosure, while others questioned the ethics of keeping wild animals in captivity. While Culber and Emritpal filed a lawsuit against the zoo, there were some interesting developments in the case. The subsequent investigations revealed that the three had alcohol in their system. 
Emmerich Paul had twice the legal limit for operating a vehicle. For Carlos and Culber, it was still under legal limits. However, authorities also found evidence of from the three men. On December 25, 2008, a life-sized sculpture of Tatiana was unveiled at the community garden on the Greenwich Steps at 274 Greenwich. A year later, the lawsuit between the two brothers and the zoo was settled for $900,000. Meanwhile, a lawsuit by Carlos's parents was settled on undisclosed terms. In that same year, Emrit Paul was sentenced to spend more than a year in state prison due to run-ins with the law, including probation violations, evading arrests, and speeding. Additionally, after filing the lawsuit, Emrit Paul was immediately arrested on suspicion of shoplifting. In 2012, Culber died of undisclosed reasons at the age of 24. It's very obvious from public records that the two brothers were likely provoking Tatiana, causing her to wreak havoc. Additionally, it was doubly sad that after Carlos tried saving his friends, they ran away from him to desperately save themselves. Ultimately, the aftermath of the Siberian tiger attack was a somber reminder of the dangers of interacting with wild animals and the importance of maintaining proper safety measures to prevent further tragedies. This story goes to show that even while visiting a zoo, accidents still happen, and if you aren't careful, it can lead to your terrifying final affliction. The tales of man-eating tigers have brought fear to all those who have heard them. There is an innate fear that grips a community as one by one they are picked off by a top predator under cover of darkness. It's the stuff of nightmares. Even today, plenty of rural communities in India and Southeast Asia are under threat of tiger attacks. Although not considered typical prey, Humans are easy targets for these apex predators. Locals know of the dangers when they go about their everyday lives. The Sundarbans, situated in the Bay of Bengal, are world famous for their tiger attacks. In fact, it is estimated that up to 50 people each year are killed by tigers in this region. As fishermen venture further into the mangrove swamps, they are often plucked from their boats by the elusive beasts, never to be seen again. But these two new incidents in today's episode have happened further north. In April 2023, two tiger attacks shook local communities in northwestern India. The two attacks occurred within days of each other, sparking fears that a new man-eater was on the prowl. The deaths of the two men sent locals into a panic, and families feared for their loved ones working in the open fields surrounding their villages. The reaction was strong. The threat of further attacks was very real, and so local government imposed curfews and shut down schools. Tigers have been known to be some of the deadliest killers on Earth, with some of these man-eaters reaching death counts into the hundreds. The first victim was a 72-year-old called Barendra Singh. He left his home on April 13, 2023, never to be seen alive again. His destination was the farmland surrounding his home. His fields were close to the Corbett Tiger Reserve, the first national park to be established in India. It is thought to be home to more than 250 Bengal tigers. Over the years, some of these tigers have escaped into surrounding farmland. With little wildlife to feast upon, they turn to other forms of prey. Villagers had seen tigers moving amongst the shadows in recent days. They had caught glimpses of their telltale stripes between the trees. The movement of the long grass as the animals slunk away. The ravaged corpses of livestock pulled into the undergrowth. In the previous week alone, six cattle had been killed and eaten by a tiger. The people knew they were in danger. As dusk was settling in, Barendra was out in his fields harvesting his wheat crop. He had worked his entire life to provide for his family. He knew his fields like the back of his hand. He had lived through tough times, through drought and through floods, but he had survived them all. As he toiled the land, something lurked in the bushes. A predator that had been drawn to the open fields and the hunting opportunities there. Cattle were easy prey. 
so were people. At 6 p.m., the tiger ran from the undergrowth. It leapt on top of the unsuspecting Barendra. He was instantly floored, and the wind knocked from his lungs as he grappled with the enormous cat. It delivered its fatal bite moments later. The 72-year-old was dead. He hadn't stood a chance. He had died alone and at work. Nobody heard his cries. Nobody came to his rescue. The tiger dragged his limp body into the surrounding woodland to eat at its leisure. Villagers grew worried when Barendra didn't return home that evening. Armed with burning torches, they began to search the farmland. They knew something must have happened to him. He never stayed out past daylight hours. It was too dangerous. After searching for two hours, they found a disturbed patch of earth, the trail of flattened vegetation that led into the bushes. Lowering their burning branches to the ground, the flames illuminated the remains of Barendra. By the flickering light, they could see that his head had been partially eaten. His injuries were reminiscent of a tiger attack. The man's death sent shockwaves through the local community, but that wasn't to be the end of it. There was more to come. Just three days later, another attack occurred in a neighboring village, also in close proximity to the Corbat Tiger Reserve. Ranveer Singh Negi hadn't been answering his phone calls. His family grew worried about the 75-year-old's whereabouts. He lived alone at his home in Simli Village in the Kaligarth Forest Division. When he didn't respond for two days, his family called villagers to check on him. Dutifully, they inspected his property. Ranveer was nowhere to be seen, but then they spotted something that made them freeze in their tracks. There was a trail of blood just yards from his house. The villagers followed the trail until it led them to some bushes 160 yards away. Carefully, they pulled back the branches and peered inside. There, lying on the ground, was the severely mauled body of Ranveer. Almost half of his entire body had been eaten. It was clear that it had been a tiger attack. A silent, deadly predator was lurking amongst them, one which could take a man without anyone knowing about it, killing a person with one fatal bite to the neck. There were no screams. Nobody had heard a commotion, and yet the 75-year-old had been taken just yards from his home. With the fear that a man-eater was on the loose, officials started to take action. People were advised not to enter the woodland or go out alone. The local district magistrate imposed a strict curfew on 25 villages in the area. Nobody was allowed out of their homes between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. every day. The 11 hours of darkness during which tigers are most likely to hunt. But people still had work to do. They still needed to venture into the forest to find fodder for their livestock. Without it, their animals would die. Without them, so would they. The Animal Husbandry Department began leaving animal fodder on people's doorsteps to prevent the need for them to forage in the surrounding woodland. It isn't the first time a tiger has escaped from the reserve. Only the year before, two friends were motorcycling along a road when a tiger leapt from the bushes. It grabbed one of the men mid-air and dragged him off, never to be seen again. The next of kin of those killed were given financial compensation. This is something that is common throughout India when a tiger strikes. But no one can rest knowing there is a potential man-eater prowling their villages. In the past, there have been occasions when tigers have ventured into people's homes, taking them from their beds as they slept. Nobody was safe. Nowhere was safe. Wildlife officials set up a cage in one of the villages with the attempt to catch the tiger. After a few days, they caught one and tranquilized it before returning it to the reserve. But there were still sightings in the farmland surrounding the villages. Three additional cages were set up in Dala and Simli villages where the two men were killed. Twenty camera traps were put out in the area. The hunt for the loose tiger or tigers was on. The question on everyone's lips was, could they catch the tiger before it struck again? Kota Ulis Karanth, a zoologist and tiger expert, has spent more than 30 years in the field studying tigers. He has seen hundreds of them up close during this time, and nearly all of them slink away at the first whiff of a human. They are fearful of people, 
but for a few rogue individuals, they have, for some reason or another, lost that fear. Some that take an opportunity to hunt humans can develop a taste for human blood. They actively seek out people, and these become known as man-eaters, the most feared of their kind. If it's the same tiger responsible for these two attacks, could it be heading towards man-eater status? Has it developed a taste for human blood? At the time of the making of this video, the investigation is still ongoing. The tiger, or tigers, responsible for the two men's death is still on the loose. There is no stopping a man-eater once it has turned to humans. The only way to deal with one is to kill it before it does the same to you, bringing another victim to their horrifying final affliction. White tigers are legendary creatures of rare power and beauty. They are symbols of purity and strength, with their presence commanding respect and awe in equal measure. With only 200 of them left on the planet, those lucky enough to catch a glimpse are treated to the mysteries of nature as the ghostly beauty of the white tiger remains etched into their minds for a lifetime. It is for their unending beauty that these big cats have been a source of attraction to circuses since their first discovery. Their ability to jump through fire hoops and perform incredible stunts make them the stars of the show. Siegfried Fischbacher and Roy Horn were stage performers who used live animals in their shows. The two met on a cruise ship in the 1960s before bringing their magic acts into the never-sleeping city of Las Vegas. Their shows, which featured acts involving cheetahs, white tigers, elephants, and lions, were unique and extravagant. Over 400,000 people would witness their daredevil theatrics on an annual basis. The crowds would guffaw with delight as the pair showcased their death-defying feats. To many, they were the magicians of the century. Over the years, the duo built a name for themselves, eventually signing a record-breaking deal worth $57 million with casino developer Steve Wynn. The five-year deal entailed the duo staging a Broadway meets Barnum & Bailey extravaganza at the prestigious Mirage Casino and Hotel. For 13 years, they performed over 30,000 unique and extravagant shows to sell out crowds, amassing a tremendous amount of wealth. The pair soon were among the Vegas royalty, living in a palatial property that they called the Jungle Palace. Here, 63 tigers and 16 lions roamed freely, at times sharing the bed and pool with Roy Horn. With this number, Siegfried and Roy owned 10% of the world's white tigers at the time. Since his childhood, Roy had a big place in his heart for animals. For most of the big cats on his compound, he had raised them from birth, building trust and friendship with them. He considered them his family. His love for these graceful beasts was so big that he meditated with at least one tiger every day. Siegfried was a technical wizard, an exemplary magician, and the brains behind illusions and magic tricks, while Roy was the animal master. He had a charming animal magnetism that allowed him to command the big cats with a flick of his finger. The pair completed each other. On Friday the 3rd of October, 2003, Roy hosted a party at the Mirage Hotel Theater to celebrate his 59th birthday. Amid the laughter and company of his friends, he raised a toast to his partner, Siegfried, in celebration of the 44 years they had spent together. The mood was a joyous one, with a buzz of excitement in the air. But unbeknownst to them, what had started as a day of celebration would later turn into a night of horror. In the evening, Roy stepped onto the stage with one of his favorite tigers, Manticore. Manticore was born in Guadalajara, Mexico. Unfortunately, he had been rejected by his mother shortly after birth, and the duo had taken him in and hand-raised him. At six months old, Roy bonded with the cub and introduced him to their live shows. 
Their bond and trust had grown over the period with Manticore performing over a dozen times alongside Roy. With well-rehearsed acts, the tiger provided something that marveled the crowd. He knew the drills inside out. However, despite performing thousands of shows, the duo had never encountered a serious mishap until that fateful Friday. The theater was a canvas of darkness, with a lone spotlight trained at the center of the stage. The transfixed audience held their breath with their eyes glued to the stage, and as the curtains gradually rose, they got on their feet, cheering and clapping as the figure of Roy and Manticore came under the spotlight. The theater was in full swing, alive with sounds of applause. Roy stretched out his arms, tasting the air as he acknowledged the crowd's applause. Being his birthday, he was ready to give the audience a truly memorable show. As Roy was leading Manticore around the stage, something in the audience startled the tiger. He broke routine and advanced towards the crowd, breaking free from his master's hold. There was no barrier between the stage and the audience, Hence, it was easy for Manticore to lunge at the occupants of the front row seats. On seeing this, Roy put himself between the tiger and the crowd. He then commanded Manticore to lie down as he tried to reach out and grab the chain around his neck. The tiger disobeyed the order and grabbed Roy's hand, sinking its canines into his flesh. With the free hand holding a wireless microphone, Roy again commanded Manticore Release! Manticore was resolute, and without warning, he swiped at Roy's feet, knocking him down. Roy came thudding to the floor. With a painful groan, he tried to get back to his feet, but before he could, the 400-pound Manticore pounced on him, pinning him down with its declawed paws. The tiger then opened its mouth wide open with its teeth glinting under the spotlights, and with a powerful bite, ripped Roy by the neck. To some of the audience, this was part of the act, but in reality, the bite had severed Roy's jugular vein, barely missing the carotid artery. The crowd gasped as blood shot all over the stage. On seeing this, Siegfried joined the action, shouting no, no to Manticore. He didn't listen. Instead, he dragged Roy 30 feet off the stage, literally like a rag doll, as a witness would later recall. Trainers rushed at the tiger trying to get it to drop Roy. They squeezed and swept a fire extinguisher at the tiger's face, but in vain. They then beat its head using the butt of the fire extinguisher, and eventually, Manticore dropped Roy as he retreated to his cage. The mood in the fully packed theater changed. The commotion had stirred a number of people in the crowd. Backstage, Roy lay motionless in a pool of blood. By the time the emergency medical officers arrived, his state was critical. He had lost almost two-thirds of his blood. In the ambulance, the medical team managed to stop the bleeding as Roy murmured, Do not shoot the cat, before going to slumber. At the University Medical Center, he was quickly rushed to surgery. In addition to tearing his jugular, the tiger had also crushed Roy's windpipe and sliced his vertebrae. Roy suffered a stroke, and the surgeons had to remove a quarter of his skull in order to reduce swelling on his brain. The medical team fought to bring Roy back as his heart gave up at least three times during the surgery. Siegfried was in shock. He couldn't picture the pain his lifelong friend had gone through. Back at the Mirage Theater, word had already spread through Las Vegas like wildfire. In a city full of risky gamblers, few were betting on Roy's survival. But against all odds, two days after the fatal incident, Roy began responding to questions. He answered by squeezing his hand once for yes and twice for no. For someone on the ventilator, unable to speak or swallow, he displayed the will to live. He recovered better than most people had anticipated. Three months later, friends and family were in immense joy as Roy murmured his first words, 
since that fateful night. After the attack, protests and outroar from animal rights groups propelled the U.S. Department of Agriculture to open investigations on the incident. They wanted to investigate any violation of animal welfare. The U.S. Department of Agriculture then proposed that the audience should be at a sufficient distance with barriers erected in the presence of such ferocious animals. On the other hand, animal rights groups argued that show animals be retired and released out in the wild. Roy spent his days in their jungle palace watching the big cats, but he was dissatisfied. He wanted to end the Las Vegas extravaganza on a high note. And so, six years after the incident, the duo made a miraculous return to the stage for one last act. Old and not as physically fit as before, the show didn't have the same energy and thrill, but it was still a fitting end to the duo's tremendous career. As for Manticore, he spent the rest of his days at the Jungle Palace until 2013, when he died from an illness. The German duo was deeply devastated, despite their close encounter with their final affliction. Around the turn of the 20th century, in the Kanchanpur district of western Nepal, a young man set out from his village into the jungle, armed with a decrepit old muzzle loader, while towing a goat. He had built a tiger hunting stand, where he tied the goat to an earthed pen and mounted it onto a tree, lying in wait for the majestic Bengal tiger. Hours elapsed, and by the time the sun was setting over the horizon, his initial excitement of hunting a tiger had turned to boredom and irritation. Dusk was fast approaching, but still the scrawny goat stood tethered and untouched. He began to doubt if the tiger would show up at all. But then it happened. The tiger gracefully appeared with a force unlike any he had ever seen. It attacked the goat with appalling power, which was a big contrast to its beauty. It was as if the dappled patterns of the forest floor themselves had come alive and possessed it. The goat had no time to neither cry nor move. One moment it was alive, and the next it was gone. The young man's mission was suddenly called to question. To him, the notion of shooting the tiger felt impossibly bold. It was as if he was assassinating a king and not just a mere animal. He noted how massive it was in size with its eyes more similar to his than any other creature he had ever encountered. He watched as two cubs playfully appeared from behind the trees looking for their mother. This only soured his conviction further, but he had to make a decision to shoot or not to shoot. With the tigress in his sight, he took one deep breath and then pulled the trigger. The tigress dropped the goat and dashed back into the forest with the taste of its own blood filling her mouth. The cubs hesitated for a moment before obediently following her. The bullet had broken the tigress's upper and lower canine on the right side of its mouth. However, in pulling the trigger, the young man had unknowingly created a monster. In 1903, the indigenous Taru woodcutters, herders, and farmers harvesting grass for their livestock started disappearing. They would venture into the vast Nepalese jungle and vanish without a trace. The Bengal tigress had begun its revenge without warning. Soon enough, it went on a hunting spree, bringing entire villages of western Nepal to their knees. It attacked with stunning speeds, snapping necks with its powerful jaws as its razor-sharp claws pinned down and shredded the victim's flesh. What began as rustling in the tall grass or a whisper of padded feet would end with an explosion of primal savagery that would be over in seconds. From men and women to even children, the soon-to-be-famous beast made the locals prisoners in their own homes. Normally, Bengal tigers don't kill or eat humans. They are semi-nocturnal predators that fear humans and will generally change direction at the first sight of man rather than confronting him. However, this lone tigress had developed a rather startling behavior 
of not only losing its inborn fear of man, but also hunting him. It had ceased behaving like a tigress, prowling around villages and stalking humans in broad daylight. With a broken pair of canines, it meant that she was unable to hunt her usual prey and had found an easier meal that was slow and unable to defend itself. Humans. The locals were there for the taking. The villagers decided that if anyone was going into the jungle, they had to be in groups. But this didn't help. The elusive tigress was smart enough to only strike when one wandered off alone, dismembering their body parts as it tore them to pieces, leaving nothing but their tattered, bloody clothes. The attacks became so frequent that the locals thought there was more than one tigress attacking them. Soon enough, the beast had racked up an insane number of victims, nearing 200 people. This birthed its name, Chumpawat, which translates to the destroyer of man. The best hunters among the villagers organized hunting parties to kill the man-eater, but she was a professional in hiding and staying clear of their traps and paths. She was much more cunning and intelligent than any tigress they had ever hunted. With the rising death toll, the Nepalese government intervened and sent in the army. The soldiers made several attempts to corner and capture or kill the tigress, but were also unsuccessful. However, before they could declare their mission failed, they had one last trick up their sleeves. They gathered a massive hunting party consisting of hunters mounted on elephants, local volunteers, and the soldiers themselves, and together formed a vast line, which they were to use and drive the devil of Chumpawat out of its hideout. The line then pushed through the jungle using the ancient Nepalese ring hunt method and slowly closed in on the tigress like a massive pincer. The tigress was overwhelmed by the collective thunder of a hundred rifles firing, thousands of men screaming, and dozens of elephants blasting their trumpets into the air. With its last hope of survival being to run in the opposite direction, it dashed into the Sharda River and crossed over, seeking refuge in the neighboring country, India. They had successfully forced the tigress out of Nepal. The Nepalese government then called off the army, given that it was no longer their problem. However, in its new territory, the tigress moved on to feast on the villagers of Kumoan, India. It had tasted blood and was hungry for more. Hunters, as well as the local authorities, hunted for the beast. But just like before, she was always one step ahead. The man-eater was always on the move traveling long distances at night and seldomly stayed near a kill site for more than a few days. She went on a rampage, operating with almost supernatural efficacy from one Indian village to another. She grabbed any human irrespective of the time of day and dragged them deep into the jungle where she would devour them. By 1907, her known victims had went up from 200 to over 400 in numbers. It was then that the Indian government paid a courtesy call to Jim Corbett, who was an expert marksman and a master tracker to help kill the tigress. At first, Jim was reluctant, but eventually agreed, but only on two conditions. The first was that all the soldiers and hunters who were already in pursuit of the tigress were to be called off, because he didn't want to risk being shot by a stray bullet. And the second, that the government had to withdraw all the existing bounties on the tigress. This was because the bounties had led to the killing of more than 1,000 innocent tigers while in pursuit of the man-eating tigress. Both of his conditions were met, and he leapt into action. He recruited six other Kumaoni men for the hunt, and they set out for Pali just as news arrived that the tigress had struck again. Traveling light and moving fast, the men marched on foot, passing over hills and valleys, with none having an idea of the horrors that awaited them on the other side. On the 3rd of May, 1907, the men entered the village of Pali, but they felt as though they were in a ghost town. The central courtyard was bare, and the stone huts were silent. It was like an abandoned village. 
not a soul outside. Something terrible had happened here. For five days, the villagers had not gone beyond their own doorsteps and were in a state of abject terror. In the next three days, Jim and his men patrolled the dense forest near Pali, but when the tigress failed to show up, they concluded that it must have shifted its hunting ground to the nearby village, Chumpawut. Early the next morning, they set out toward the village. They arrived just immediately after it had dragged a 16-year-old girl collecting firewood into the forest. The men followed the blood trail leading into a ravine. They found bone splinters, a human leg still trickling warm blood, and her skirt along the trail of carnage. The irrefutable evidence of horror was saddening and sickening, and the Chumpawat tiger was nowhere to be seen. The next day, with the help of the local volunteers who flashed out the tigress, Jim Corbett fired three shots from his double-barreled black powder rifle, bringing the tigress's seven years of terror to an end. He had accomplished that which was deemed all but impossible. The tigress was paraded in the surrounding villages, and they couldn't help but notice how smaller and less imposing it was now than when alive. Celebrations followed and went deep into the night with the sound of jubilant songs filling the air. A closer examination of Chumpawat's carcass revealed that it had tattered canines which had left it helpless in defending its hunting ground against other tigers. This in turn had forced it to venture into the human settlements. Additionally, the humans had raised the jungles for timber and farmlands, driving the tigers and their usual prey out of their habitats. The Chumpawat tigers' attacks were listed in the Guinness Book of World Records as the highest number of human fatalities from a tiger. At the time of her death, the tigress had devoured 436 souls, not counting livestock and wild game. This number is believed to be more than any other individual killer, man or animal, before or even in years to come. Some described her as the most prolific serial killer of human life the world had ever seen. In eastern Russia lies Kamchatka Peninsula. This long spit of land stretches for over 770 miles and covers an area of over 100,000 square miles. This vast volcanic peninsula is breathtakingly beautiful, yet sometimes lethal. The winters in Kamchatka are long and severe, with prolonged cold and snowy weather. Temperatures can reach as low as minus 30 degrees Celsius or minus 20 Fahrenheit. Yet the weather isn't the only lethal thing around. Back in the 1920s, the people of Kamchatka weren't only battling the elements, there was another killer on the loose, a man-eater. A Siberian tiger, weighing up to 800 pounds, was prowling the villages on the peninsula, picking off individuals one by one. The death toll began to mount up. The first victim of the tiger was a young man from the village of Kluchi. He was out chopping wood one afternoon in the forests on the fringes of the frozen tundra. The sound from the falling trees had caught the attention of the tiger some two miles away. With each blow of the axe, the tiger inched closer. Its carefully placed paws made deep footprints in the snow. Its white underbelly lightly brushed the glistening ground. Stealthily, the tiger crept through the woodland until it could see the woodsman. A clear line of sight, the tiger locked its eyes onto its target, and with that, the young man's fate had already been sealed. A few more strokes of the axe and the tiger rushed at him. The young man caught a glimpse of something orange and black out of the corner of his eye. He turned just in time to see a huge tiger launch itself right at him. It knocked him to the ground, knocking the air from his lungs. He tried to fight back, but the sheer weight of the animal kept him pinned to the cold, hard snow. Then the bite came. The tiger wrapped its canines around the man's neck, crushing his windpipe. The man lay still in the snow. The tiger dragged the man's body into the woods to feast on him at its leisure. As the orange glow of the sun's last light faded onto the horizon, the icy tundra and surrounding woods fell into darkness. The man's wife raised the alarm when he did not return home that evening. A few of the villagers launched a search and rescue mission. 
Anyone left out after dark was unlikely to survive the night during Siberia's harsh winters. They walked straight to the site where the young man had been chopping wood. There was no sign of him, but his axe lay on the ground next to a pile of wood. Looking closer by torchlight, they spotted a trail, a trail of blood. It was leading into the woods. Cautiously, they followed it. Less than 200 yards into the trees, they found their fallen comrade. It was clear that he had been attacked and killed by a tiger. This was just the beginning. Over the next few months, three villages along the Kamchatka Peninsula were subjected to multiple tiger attacks. The tiger was indiscriminate. Villagers, young and old, were found savagely mauled yards from their houses. People went out to work in the fields never to be seen again. That terrifying first winter lasted from October 1923 until April 1924 and claimed more than 15 lives. As spring sprung and the fields of snow and ice melted, more and more bodies were discovered. They all showed the characteristic signs of a tiger attack. Bloodied and dismembered, they lay scattered like rubbish on the icy plains. When the temperature began to warm the land, there was no sign of any more tiger attacks. People began to sigh in relief. Children were allowed to play outside once more, and farmers tended their fields without fear. It seemed the tiger had moved on. Maybe it had died or found new territory. Whatever had happened to it, people felt like they could breathe again and tried to put that devastating winter behind them. But this was not the end. As Kamchatka Peninsula descended once more into the harsh winter towards the end of 1924, the tiger struck again. This time, the elusive beast was bold. It was brazen. Not only did it pick off individuals who braved the outdoors, but terrifyingly, it began to enter people's homes. Like the devil himself, the tiger plucked people from their beds as they lay sleeping. In the dead of night, screams were heard throughout the village as time and time again, the tiger feasted. No one was safe. The communities plagued by death of loved ones called on the army to help. Not only did basic hunters try to track down the tiger, even a Red Army company came to the aid of the terrified villagers. The soldiers of the Soviet Union scoured the surrounding landscape for any signs of the beast. They were granted permission to use an aircraft to help them spot the tiger from the air. Eventually, a large tiger was tracked down and killed. The army celebrated the kill, posing for photos in front of the striped feline. It was an impressive animal, about 10 feet long and weighing 330 pounds. They were hailed heroes by the local communities, but the local hunters weren't convinced. When they inspected the dead tiger more closely, they felt a shudder run down their spines. Though an impressive tiger, the paws of this one weren't nearly big enough. The local hunters had seen the killer's paw prints in the snow before and they had measured over 8 inches. This tiger didn't measure up. As winter descended on the villages towards the end of 1925, the attacks commenced once more. The villagers had been lulled into a false sense of security. The soldiers had given them hope and now those hopes were dashed. They began to feel like this nightmare would never end. They began to feel that the tiger really was the devil. It evaded capture for the rest of the winter season, taking yet more innocent lives. The villagers grew weary. The only evidence left by the tiger apart from the trail of corpses was its footprints. Aside from being enormous, possibly belonging to one of the largest tigers ever to have lived, the footprints gave more information about the great animal. One of its four paw prints was less indented than the others, suggesting that the foot bore less weight. It was assumed that the animal had an injury and walked with an unusual gait. This could have explained the attacks. A predator that is less able to hunt its typical prey looks elsewhere. The villagers of Kamchatka Peninsula were easy targets. Lighter, slower, and less defensive than caribou, humans were there for the taking. After yet another wearisome winter, the tiger suddenly seemed to have vanished. Spring returned and the people cautiously went about their everyday business. When winter came in 1926, the locals braced themselves for another round of killings, but it never came. For three consecutive winters, the tiger had devoured the Russian people. Over 100 people were killed in 1923, 24, and 25. The remains of most were found days or even weeks later, but some simply vanished without a trace. 
Since then, and with generations gone by, people still talk of the winters when the devil came to town. No one knows what happened to the tiger. Perhaps it went off to find new hunting grounds. This seems unlikely though, as an apex predator with little to fear, a large territory with bountiful prey, it would be foolish to leave. Perhaps the tiger died, or perhaps it really was the devil, and the devil eventually returned to the fiery depths of hell after sending over 100 innocent people to their unfortunate final affliction. The tiger weighs over 500 pounds and can grow to be 3 meters or 10 feet long from nose to tail. With sharp canine teeth over 3 inches long, it can tear apart entire limbs in a single bite. The Siberian tiger is known to possess a particularly vengeful and begrudging attitude towards anyone that dares cross its path, man or beast. With a cunning mind to match, it can remember encounters for weeks and plan elaborate plots to follow and hunt its prey. Once a near extinct species, the predator also known as the Amur tiger had come back to life through conservation efforts and repopulated the province of Primoria, near the world's largest undammed river, the Amur River. For decades, the tiger sat comfortably at the top of the food chain, feeding on moose, elk, and wild boar. That was until humans started populating the region, trying to scrape out a living in the dense taiga forests after the fall of the Soviet Union. Poachers realized the potential of this area, despite the fact that they had to settle among some of the most dangerous predators in the world. The meat of the Siberian tiger and the wild boar fetched good money in the black markets near the Chinese border, and for many like Markov, this was their only sustenance in the broken post-Soviet economy. On a cold winter morning in 1997, Markov loaded his supplies, kissed his wife goodbye, and set out with his friend on a 50-mile drive deep in the heart of the frozen taiga forest. The plan was to spend the night in a remote cabin and leave to hunt in the morning. As the sun dawned, he set out on foot accompanied by his attack dogs who could also be used to sniff out the scent of the Siberian tigers from their footprints. In below freezing temperatures, the snow covered the solid ground by at least 10 inches as Markov limped his way through the layers of snow among the forest trees and thick brush. Markov spotted a trail of footprints that were even bigger than his hand. Prints as large as this could only belong to the great Siberian tiger. He followed the tracks for miles hoping they would lead him to the animal they belonged to. Armed with a shotgun, Markov was confident that he was one clear shot away from a kill that could make him good money in this failing economy. Then as he peered over one of the trees, he saw the enormous Siberian tiger feeding on a wild boar. It looked over at the man locking eyes for a few seconds before going back to eating, refusing to let go of its kill. The fierce animal looked unfazed as its muscles rippled with every bite of flesh it pulled from the dead boar. Markov realized he was close enough to get the clear shot he needed. He raised his shotgun and fired a bullet straight into its torso. It was a sure hit, he thought. It was only a matter of time that the tiger would succumb to the fatal injury. He walked ahead, salvaged whatever meat he could from the carcass of the dead wild boar, and followed the tiger a few more miles as it limped away injured in the deep snow. The white snow made it easy to follow the blood trail, but he noticed it decreasing the farther he went along in its pursuit. It wasn't long afterwards that the trail stopped, and Markov was left standing alone in the snow with no idea of where the tiger was, dead or alive. He quickly realized that the tiger must not have been fatally wounded and decided to head back to his camp to return the next day. He stored one piece of the boar meat just outside of his camp and left for town to see what he could trade for the other one. But while Markov was away, the wounded tiger had followed the scent of the man to the cabin and smelled its boar hunt stored outside in the wellhead. In frustration, the tiger reclaimed his kill and destroyed the wellhead in the process. It then camped outside near the cabin, awaiting the man's return. When Markov got back to the cabin, he noticed his dogs barking loudly and incessantly, trying to signal to him that something wasn't right. He peered through the window and saw the tiger at a distance. He called his dogs back into the cabin. If the injured tiger had still not left after reclaiming its boar meat, he was after more than just the boar meat. Markov realized that the animal had come for vengeance 
and he could not afford to let it live once it had smelled his scent. He set up his gun through a shooting port in the wall and open fired, wounding the tiger twice now from the same gun. It disappeared into the forest, still able to carry itself despite being shot several times. Markov decided to go to his friend Dunja's cabin not far away and drive away to safety with him in his car. His friend urged him to stay the night at his place because the car's radiator fluid had to be drained every night to keep it running, and they couldn't leave right away. Markov was now visibly frustrated and decided to make his way back to his cabin and deal with the problem the only way a poacher knows, by shooting the tiger until he's dead. Little did he know in his absence, the tiger had torn down his cabin's front door and had made its way inside, chewing and clawing at anything that had Markov's scent on it. It shred to pieces clothing, mattresses, and tools that he had used, and then found a well-hidden spot outside the trail to lie in wait for Markov's return. It was dark and Markov was just making his way to the entrance of the cabin when he was ambushed by the tiger. Caught unarmed, he soon found himself at the mercy of the vengeful Siberian tiger, and after their last two encounters, there wasn't much mercy left. Several hours later, investigators discovered a chilling scene outside of the camp, one that captured the grueling nature of the attack and the terrified helplessness of Markov in his final moments before being devoured. The snow around the scene had melted and flattened from the wrestling and wriggling that Markov must have tried while being eaten alive. There wasn't much to call Markov's body anyway. A few bones here, a pool of blood, red snow there, some of his clothes were found several feet away, his shoes still carried his severed feet, his sleeves still held his detached arms. The tiger was momentarily pacified after tearing apart its hunter and headed downstream. Word had now gotten out of the man-eating Siberian tiger, and terrified poachers and settlers evacuated the taiga forest to escape the same fate as Markov. The only one still in the area was 25-year-old Andrei Pachutnya. He was a trapper who had set up traps in the forest to catch animals for their fur. Andrei's parents urged him not to leave the house to check his traps until the tiger had been found, but he did not heed any advice to stay inside and set out in the forest. In Andrei's absence, the tiger had found his cabin and thrashed it just like it did to Markov's cabin. The Siberian tiger seemed to want to follow and tear to pieces anything that smelled remotely human. Upon his return, he was ambushed by the tiger near a neighbor's cabin, nestled behind a mattress as if it had been lying in wait for him all along. There was not much fight or resistance. Andre attempted to pull his shotgun from his shoulder and take aim, but the bullet refused to fire. In the harsh Russian winters, older guns were known to have ammunition failures from a frozen cartridge. His shotgun failed at the last moment he would have wanted it to. Andre was now easy pickings for the Siberian tiger, as it jumped on top of him leaving him little chance for a fight. Young Andre's father called for a search and rescue mission to find his son, and they did. But all that was now left of Andre was a few bloodied clothes and a chard of the cross. The tiger had been feeding on him for over three days when the search team discovered him and there was little of Andrew they could salvage from the site to return to his father. At the time, Project Tiger was a Western-funded animal conservation group operating in the Taiga Forest, trying to stop illegal hunters and poachers from driving the Siberian tiger to the brink of extinction. The head tracker for the mission, Yuri Trush, found himself in an ironic predicament. As a tiger conservationist and a researcher himself, he was tasked by the authorities to find the injured tiger and kill it on the spot. He was accompanied by officers Shibnev and Pionka, and the trio soon discovered the tracks of a limping tiger. It had been walking on three legs, carrying one in the air likely wounded. The tracks led them to a remote area near the cabin of a man named Shlomenko. The party now knew the tiger was nearby. They listened closely to every ruffle in the trees and then saw the slightest movement in their field of vision. As they went close to the cabin entrance, the giant Siberian tiger leapt at Officer Trush from behind with a deafening loud roar. All three men frantically tried to aim their guns at the tiger, but it was too late for the head tracker, as he quickly found himself beneath the angry behemoth tiger, clawing and gnawing at his vulnerable body. In the heat of the moment, the trio had fired dozens of bullets, and 11 of those hit the tiger, which after a few seconds finally collapsed and died. 
Gathering his senses, Officer Trush tried to figure out where his rifle had gone, only to later realize it had partially gone down the tiger's throat as it jumped to him. The Siberian tiger was loaded onto a truck and taken to the village to confirm that it was indeed the correct tiger. The tiger, after killing, maiming, and terrorizing settlers for far too long, had now finally been killed. The animal was later skinned and put up for display in the region's administrative headquarters as a stark reminder of the horror brought by the man-eating tiger and a lesson for what happens when man and beast cross each other's paths, and in this situation, leading to two people's terrifying final affliction. <laughs>